Thank you, Gilad. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you wake up early after the wine yesterday and, and come to the session. Um, feel free to, to have uh, more interactive. So if you have any questions, just uh, feel free. Don't be shy. Raise your, head, uh, raise your hand. And I'll try to, to take uh, any question throughout the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the co-design architectures. Uh, the thing that we're doing on the network, especially to enable new paradigm, especially uh, uh, the, the emergence of the new uh, co-processors. So if you're talking about the design that uh, went forward for many years, uh, which is very CPU-centric, just taking a bunch of CPUs, doing everything on the CPU, communicating through the network, but having the bulk of things being done on the CPU, it, it just it works for many years, but it doesn't scale anymore. And it's uh, clear and quite obvious that uh, if you want to reach uh, exascale, if you want to do faster, better, scalable, uh, then we need to look at uh, co-design. And if we look at co-design, uh, we really need to look at all the elements together, how we tie them together, how we make optimized transfers uh, between them, how we make, where we make the processing, and so on. So definitely we want the CPU to do computation, but there are many coprocessors that are also doing uh, computation. We want to look at in-network computation. We want to have smart storage, and we want to have software and everything working together in harmony, and that's the base of, of co-design. If we look at uh, network technologies, then in, in the past, as I mentioned, if you look at the CPU-centric uh, architecture, then all the processing was done in the CPU. The network has uh, very basic capabilities, talking about feeds and speed, moving the data fast from one side to the other. We can even talk about offload. But now as we move forward into the future, we identify things that we'd better do within the network. So keep uh, doing and delivering much more value within the network is definitely the way to go and enable the new paradigm and enable better scalability uh, towards the exascale. So how does that uh, look from the, uh, let's call it a value chain of the total ROI that uh, you can deliver building a data center with the right architecture? So if you look at the uh, left-hand side, then you can see the CPU in the traditional um, a CPU-centric architecture, then basically the CPU is spending its cycles, part of them on computation, and the other part of doing I.O. So this is definitely something that can be offloaded to the adapter so that to make sure that the CPU will focus on the computation and that you get much more value from the CPU, and I.O. will be fully offloaded by the network. And then if you look at the value that the network brings, so obviously feeds and speeds are important, and if you want to go uh, to, um, to exascale, you need to go uh, to 100 gig, and beyond 100 gig, you want to move to 200 and further. Uh, you want to reduce the latency, but you want to add more and more value and more and more intelligence into the network, such that the overall value for the solution, for the system that you're building, uh, will be high. And I'm going to uh, go and talk more and more into the intelligence that we want to put uh, into the network. So, so again, the, the, the need to actually bring things, uh, bring uh, uh, flexibility and bring intelligence into the network comes from the pace of innovation that is needed uh, in order to scale. So if you look at what happened 10 years ago, then we had a very uh, relatively small, uh, slow network compared to what we're used now. We're talking about tens of microsecond uh, to complete an operation. If you look, if you take it further up to the communication library and communication framework and looking at uh, into complicated operations like collective uh, operations, then we're talking about hundreds of microseconds. Uh, today, the performance is an order of magnitude faster and even two orders of magnitude faster sometimes. The network latency is in the order of hundreds of uh, nanoseconds and to complete a uh, collecti collective operation, you're talking about uh, going to microseconds or 10 uh, of microsecond order of magnitude. But as we move forward and we want to enable scalability to exascale and build more efficient system, we realize that it's really important to further be able to 
to cut down latency and reduce the latency in the design, but also to look at the overall value of the system. And the overall value of the system is not just the feeds and speed of the network, it's rather how much time does it take you to, to actually perform the collective uh, operation. And this is how you can actually go and co-design a solution where you can cut down the latency of complex operation uh, by order of magnitude and get them processed uh, within the network. And what's interesting about it is that uh, if you go to larger scale, you even see uh, much more benefits. And the idea here is to tailor together the software and operation that used to run on the server, just push them into the network, and with the right code design and the right software abstractions, you can actually uh, achieve that uh, being uh, completely transparent uh, to the software, to the existing uh, software application. So switch IB2 is the first uh, smart switch. And this is a basic, uh, basically it's an InfiniBand uh, switch that has um, um, this uh, smart capability of in-network uh, uh, processing, and that will enable uh, reducing uh, the overall latency of complex operation uh, substantially by an order of magnitude. So in terms of feeds and speed of uh, switch IB2, it's, um, it's an InfiniBand switch. It has a very low latency of uh, less than 90 uh, nanosecond, which is a uh, very good improvement from the previous uh, um, um, from the previous uh, QDR and FDR generations. Uh, it has 36 ports. They're all uh, running and capable of 100 gig uh, EDR, total of 7.2 terabits uh, per second, 7 billion messages per second. It has all the cool uh, infinite features that you probably are familiar, like adaptive routing, congestion control, flexible topology, uh, and, and, and so on. And in addition, it has a new protocol that is called Sharp that is completely offloaded in the hardware, and that's the intelligence part uh, of that switch, and those are uh, in-network uh, computing uh, capabilities that are added into the switch. So what is SHARP? SHARP stands for uh, Scalable Hierarchical Aggregation Protocol. Uh, this is a new protocol that, uh, uh, that is designed into the switch and enable the switch fabric to hierarchically perform a collective uh, operation. Uh, they enable definitely uh, MPI as well as uh, SHMEM. Uh, collective operations, and those collective operations will be pushed into the network, enable things like reduction and barrier uh, to really happen and be processed within the network much more efficiently, much more faster, and uh, actually talking about gains of 10x, uh, 10x um, in performance. And this is very scalable because of the structure of uh, that uh, protocol uh, being hierarchical. And as we look at um, uh, synthetic benchmarks, uh, and this is an example of uh, finite element uh, mini application, those are kernel that mimic the application behavior. And if you look here on the x-axis, you can actually see uh, the number of nodes growing anywhere from 32, which is a single switch, all the way to 8K nodes. Then actually the gain from doing the collectives inside the network, and here we're talking about of eight byte uh, all reduced operation, the actual gains are, is, is actually increasing as the scale increases. And the main reason is that doing those collective within the host take a lot of communication back and forth between the servers, whereas if you go hierarchically within the switches and put the intelligence and the processing of the collective inside the switches, you can actually get substantially better performance and actually do it on one path going up the network and, and going down. So we're talking anywhere from uh, 10x performance all the way to 25x uh, performance improvement thanks to co-design um, of the uh, collective operations, putting them into the network. So a little bit about the, the co-design that we're doing and the intelligence that we're putting into the network. Um, basically, if you ask Mellanox, then we'll always tell you that the CPU should focus on the application, on the computation, put all the I.O. away from the CPU, make the CPU focus on doing whatever it needs to do. That's the best ROI on the CPU. And then you start doing the I.O. inside the adapter. 
So basically, we have all the technologies in, inside the adapter. In this example, is the Connectix 4. Having all the I.O. done in Connectix 4, meaning that it has to support the full transport for RDMA. So all the segmentation, reassembly, retransmission, transport, all of them is being processed by the hardware. You don't need to worry about that in the CPU. Um, it has RDMA operation, meaning that you can just directly place data in the right buffers, um, meaning uh, that the, the transfers are extremely efficient. SRIOV that enable you to implement clouds and virtualization. Uh, collective operations is something that we also have uh, inside the adapter. Those are higher level features that uh, enable um, that enable you to reduce the impact of uh, system and operating system noise uh, on the, the on the performance of collective. Peer direct that enable better collaboration uh, with the GPU. That I'm going to talk about that. Uh, uh, soon, so per direct can be used for GPU as well as uh, optimization for storage. GPU directs, then there are several other uh, storage and other optimization that are available in the Connectix 4. Basically, take all the I.O. into the adapter, offload it, plus do extra operation uh, that can be done on data uh, on flight. And then the new thing that was introduced in Switch AB2 is to start having more and more offloads uh, going into the network, more and more compu compu computation going into the network. And the first thing in Switch AB2 was to introduce collective operation. So this is uh, yet another thing uh, of, of co-design uh, overcoming uh, some of the shortcomings of the current uh, CPU uh, server design. Uh, most of the systems that uh, are on the, on the volume play are dual socket uh, systems. And it turns out that the I.O. from one socket is substantially better than the I.O. On, from the other socket. The socket that is close to the NIC is performing much better. And whenever you're trying to do an I.O. from the socket, from the far socket, then the performance goes down, uh, mainly because of the uh, cache coherency QPI bus between the two sockets. And unfortunately, uh, that's not a, the great design, but many people, uh, I guess almost all the people are, are using the system this way. And one of the things that came out in mind when we designed the Connectix 4 is that we can alleviate that need because all the time when you run uh, large jobs, you would place half of the processes on the one CPU and the other half of the process on the other CPU and you want to have an efficient I.O. from both of them. You, do, you, you also, in addition, want to have GPU direct and be able to place GPUs on both sockets. And this is where socket direct technology comes into play. The idea with socket direct is you can see it on the right hand side. Uh, this, is, uh, this is basically the, the Connectix here and it has the PCI bus, and instead of having one PCI bus, you can actually take that PCI bus and split it into two, connect one PCI bus to one socket, the other PCI bus to the other socket, and this, one, this way, the processes on the left-hand CPU will use that PCI bus to access the adapter, the processes on that CPU will use that other PCI bus, uh, the result is obviously a lot of uh, improvement. We're talking about 50% lower CPU utilization for doing the I.O. And obviously with that CPU that you save, you can go uh, do your computation and get better uh, return on investment for the CPU. And in addition, you can get 20% uh, lower latency because you always have the access with, the, uh, with a closed core uh, to the NIC. So this is, uh, this is uh, Socket Direct, and, and basically we have evaluation kit for that, and uh, we're starting to see servers design uh, that, that take advantage of that and, and being able to uh, use the NIC much more efficiently. And this is definitely transparent to the software, um, which is yet another advantage, yet another example of how we can overall uh, optimize the system performance uh, using um, uh, the innovation. Another technology of uh, bringing, um, bringing intelligence into the network is having uh, network adapters that uh, have uh, FPGA embedded there. Uh, basically, here you can see the Connectix with uh, uh, Xilinx uh, FP, FPGA, and basically that enables uh, multiple things. First, it enables you to, uh, to innovate and uh, uh, develop uh, certain functionalities, certain processing uh, on the data path uh, for 
uh, the networking. And in addition, it enables also uh, flexibility in the field. Once you have a deployed uh, system, you can still give more flexibility. You can add functionality uh, uh, in the field. Nothing is hard-coded uh, in the FPGA. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, the applications for it is a long list of unlimited uh, features that people can actually do. Um, there, is, um, there is a short list here of things that uh, people are doing, uh, like uh, security and cryptography for the data center, uh, optimizing cloud and virtualization, storage optimization, high performance computing, uh, time synchronization, and more. With the efficiency of the interconnect, uh, uh, you can see uh, two, two great examples um, uh, for the flagship Department of Energy project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can follow up with you about it uh, later. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with you on, on the FPGA type. Okay, so uh, the two major flagship uh, department, of, department of Energy systems uh, on the Coral are going to use uh, Mellanox uh, network. Uh, they're going to use uh, the co-design and the... Um, and the optimizations that we have in the network to, to actually be able to uh, get closer and closer to, to exascale. And that's uh, one of the reasons that uh, the Mellanox interconnect was chosen. You can see uh, other examples, and, and Mellanox is definitely on the map uh, for delivering uh, exascale uh, systems. Uh, here is um, one example that we picked up of an EDR cluster uh, fairly um, um, uh, a fair size of nodes, about 4K uh, compute elements built with a network uh, from Mellanox uh, EDR um, in uh, enhanced hypercube uh, interconnect topology, as well as a file system from uh, GPFS compute from, uh, from uh, SGI uh, storage from DDN and, and so on. So as Mellanox, we have the full portfolio for 100 gig, be it uh, InfiniBand uh, EDR or Ethernet uh, 100 gig, including all the speed bumps. Uh, all the technology is uh, fully interoperable and is forward and backward compatible, so you can definitely mix and match uh, technology generation. Things will just default to the previous generation uh, to the fastest speed that, uh, things, uh, that the devices agree on. Uh, basically, if you want to take a quick look at the device, then ConnectX4 is the latest and greatest 100 gig adapter. It has the socket direct capability. It has uh, all the offloads that uh, we mentioned with a point-to-point -point latency of 0.7 uh, microsecond. Switch AB2, I mentioned that we have discussed, and this is the first intelligent switch that deploys the sharp uh, operations, uh, the sharp uh, protocol. Uh, with very low latency by itself of 90 nanoseconds. Spectrum is our 100 gig uh, switch. Uh, it has support for anywhere from 25, 50, and 100 gigabit uh, per port, anywhere from 3,200 gig ports or uh, 64, uh, 25, and 50 gigabit uh, ports. And uh, one of the key elements that we're driving with Spectrum is the Open Ethernet Initiative. Uh, a lot of open source and flexibility of software stacks to run on that switch. And uh, last but not least are the uh, interconnect technology, the cable, which we call LinkX. Uh, basically, it includes the full portfolio of transceivers, active cables, passive cables, with Vixels and silicon photonics, and obviously a copper to enable the full uh, building of the end-to-end -end, uh, cluster. So that's, in, in summary, the whole uh, Mellanox uh, portfolio. Uh, everything that has to do with interconnect within the data center, anywhere from analyzing data, communicating between the nodes, storing the data, retrieving the data, and communi communicating between the compute node and the storage node, or be it hyper-converged same nodes. So very efficient network with, with all the offloads, and we keep adding and innovating more and more uh, on that space. So we're doing anywhere from ICs, uh, cards, uh, systems, acceleration software, and management software to deliver that, the cables, 
And here we added a new portfolio that, uh, t speaking about network intelligence, uh, we acquired uh, EasyChip technology, which is focused on, which is a market leader of network processors. And with those network processors, we can further enable more and more flexibility into the network, more and more programmability and processing into the network. Might be NFV, might be HPC computation. You just name it, just the idea is to bring more flexibility and more programmability uh, into the network. Looking at EDR performance, those are uh, applications and benchmarks, just a quick uh, list of things. We're seeing numbers of anywhere from about 28% uh, percent improvement to 80% percent improvement just by taking advantage of the, <coughs> of, of the uh, improvement of the feed and speed of, of EDR, the lower latency and the higher bandwidth. We can see in uh, Alter uh, Optistruct about 40%. We can see 63% improvement in WARF, Gromax of 28 and, and, and so on. The, the best numbers we're seeing up to 80% improvement in MPI uh, FFT as part of the HP uh, CC performance suite. And uh, as, you, as you definitely see, the, the larger the scale is, the better is the improvement from, uh, from interconnecting with the latest and greatest technology. We always look at uh, interconnecting CPU, but clearly the world is uh, going forward with uh, more heterogeneous systems of computing, and the market also wants more flexibility in choosing the, the CPU. And basically, we, are, we have a lot of optimization for x86, and we're also investing in other CPU technologies such as Open Power and ARM. We, we have support for all the software stack to run on Open Power and ARM. We have certain optimization, certain functionality that we co-design together, um, together with them. We definitely have huge investment in scaling, uh, scaling uh, GPU design, so all the heterogeneous computing that carry GPU can definitely enjoy uh, the GPU direct technology, which I'm going to cover. And um, uh, uh, lately, we're also adding FPGA with more programmability and more flexibility into the network. Clearly, roadmap is, is, is really, really important to get to exascale, so it's not only what we have today, uh, just looking from uh, the past experience and looking at how much investment we have in the interconnect, uh, we have delivered uh, anywhere from since the SDR era uh, to DDR, QDR, FDR, uh, EDR now, and obviously going to exascale uh, may need a second or a third um, uh, speed bump, and we're definitely executing on track uh, to deliver the next generation. We're going to see soon the uh, system that gets closer and closer to the exascale. Those are the system on the coral. And we're heavily invested and heavily committed to deliver, um, to deliver the interconnect that is suitable for the exascale that can tie together everything with the right co-design and with the right uh, co-processing uh, capabilities. Um, looking into clouds, and uh, it's, it's clearly that uh, the IT infrastructure is, 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 is changing, and it's clear that there are many uh, HPC systems that uh, want to look at uh, taking advantage of HPC clouds. And, and, and basically, what we did is to add uh, into OpenStack, uh, making InfiniBand like a first-class uh, citizen within OpenStack. So all the code is, is upstream since Savannah. Uh, being able to first use uh, InfiniBand and secondly to use SRIOV. With SRIOV, you can actually get a bare metal performance even though you run in a virtual machine. And, and basically, that was achieved by mapping the InfiniBand entities into uh, Ethernet-like entities. So the rest of the management, you still think that you manage Ethernet, but the reality is that everything is InfiniBand taking advantage of SDN that uh, throughout the subnet uh, manager of uh, InfiniBand. And uh, it's a great fit for high-performance computing. You can see that uh, we have demonstrated 100 gig uh, clouds using EDR as well as our Ethernet. And you can see here uh, reaching uh, 92 gigabit per second VM to VM communication with less than 1% CPU involvement. And that is thanks to the single root IOV uh, getting a bare metal performance within the VM, and also 
uh, thanks to the RDMA technology. That's the only way you can really move so much data with so less uh, CPU and have a scalable approach. So any questions so far? So let's talk a little bit about software. So we realized that software is a key ingredient in, in delivering the co-design solution, and we have decided that it's a great time to, um, to redesign the software framework um, using a community effort. It's like a joint effort to design the best, uh, the best middleware uh, for the HPC community. And this is what we called uh, uh, UCX, Unified Communication X. Uh, it's a framework. It's a framework that can tie everything together, uh, tie the interconnect into MPI, into SHMEM, and, and, and so on. It's, again, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, Mellanox is part of it, but there are many other uh, players, and the idea is that everybody is bringing to the table the past knowledge, the past experience, the past uh, APIs and design, and how, uh, and, and into the table, we bring all of that together with a discussion of how we can make that better, how we can make the co-design work, and how we can get the best uh, APIs and transfers between the, the different devices. The members here include uh, Mellanox that uh, we're br bringing uh, to the table a lot of knowledge on the interconnect and the transport and, and technologies that we use to have in our proprietary uh, MXM technology. So we're going to put everything into UCX and open source that. Oak Ridge National Lab brings the knowledge from the UCCS design, blends it together into uh, UCX, including certain Infiniband optimization, as well as support for other devices that beyond Mellanox like Cray and shared memory. NVIDIA is bringing the GPU, uh, the GPU direct technology into the communication library so that to make that much more uh, efficient, as well as IBM bringing uh, ideas and concepts from PAMI, and UHUTK focus on integration with the research. So it's a community effort. People are uh, welcome to, to join and contribute, and that's going to be um, the next generation uh, middleware for uh, communication that will transparently bind into MPI and uh, OpenSchmem and enable uh, the best, uh, more, the most efficient communication. HPCX is our commercial uh, HPC uh, software suite. It comes from uh, Mellanox, including all the MPI, PIGAS, uh, SHMEM, and UPC package. Uh, a lot of focus on stability is, and robustness, as well as getting the best application performance. And it's available for commercial and open source application. Contact us if you, uh, if you need that. And uh, it's based on the UCX uh, framework, so that to able, enable the most uh, efficient communication. UCX is definitely also something that is, is, uh, is an open source framework, so there's nothing proprietary anymore there. Just get the best efficiency um, from the communication stack. Those are, I have like two examples of the performance benefit of uh, HPCX uh, suite. Uh, one example, is the Palace uh, benchmark for uh, all reduce and barrier. You can see uh, the latency of OpenMPI, of the native code in OpenMPI, and the underlying is HPCX, which is substantially uh, faster and more efficient uh, using the HPCX uh, collective uh, optimizations. Uh, this is, by the way, before, uh, before the, uh, the switch collective offload, which will further definitely improve things. Uh, and we have another example of Quantum Espresso comparing HPCX uh, uh, by Bull compared to Intel MPI. And basically, we're talking about 37% improvement in small scale, and in larger scale, it even grows to 61% improvement of the overall uh, Quantum Espresso performance. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the GPU. So. GPU is here, and uh, many of the clusters and the systems that people build have heterogeneous computing. They have a lot of x86 CPUs and a lot of GPUs. That's uh, one of the great ways uh, to scale. Uh, with some investment in GPU kernel, you, ac you can actually bump up the, uh, the flops uh, of your system in a very economic way. So we identify that, but there's clearly uh, a lot of room to improve the overall performance of such system and move data much more efficiently 
between the different compute elements within the system, and namely here between the GPUs uh, themselves, because when you're doing a computation across GPUs, then what, what's really important between the computation interval is to be able to move the data as fast and efficient as as fast as, and as efficient as possible between the, the different uh, GPU. So long story short, we came up with the technology of GPU Direct, and we are now into the third generation of uh, GPU Direct, and what we can do uh, together with the NVIDIA GPUs uh, using our peer di direct technology, we can actually move directly uh, uh, data from one GPU memory into another GPU memory without any CPU intervention, without, any, uh, without touching any, any intermediate memory of the CPU, just move the data between the GPU very efficiently. So that definitely, f one, it optimizes the overall system performance. Uh, second, um, it's, um, uh, it enables much more, a uh, much less latency of moving data around between uh, the GPU, so your computation can start uh, faster and the data exchange is, is, is substantially more uh, efficient. And it further enables also the ARCUDA that uh, I'll talk about in a second and was also mentioned in the first day talk um, by Federico. Okay, so here is one example of the GPU Direct in a HUMD application. Uh, you can see about 102% improvement. It's about 2x application performance improvement, uh, taking advantage of moving the data more efficiently uh, between nodes. And we decided not to stop at GPU Direct 3 because GPU Direct 3 mainly focused on the control path, um, oh, sorry, focused on the data path between the GPU, how we efficiently move the data between the GPU, but it didn't give the full coverage for the control path. So still, once the GPU finishes the kernel, you still have to signal back to the main CPU and that the main CPU has to tell the other CPU uh, the data uh, has arrived and, and so on. So still, data goes with GPU direct, control goes for the main CPU, and we thought, let's go and, and, and even speed that up so that the <coughs> next interval of computation can start faster. And this is all about the GPU direct uh, 4.0, where actually the GPU is, be, is, is able to take part of the networking uh, communication and be able to push the data as, as at the moment if the kernel is finished, the GPU can directly uh, post the operation and, and send a message to the remote other uh, GPU. And here you can see two examples of uh, 2D stencil operation. You can actually see that thanks to the uh, GPU Direct 4, you can actually gain about 27 or 23 percent uh, improvement uh, by uh, moving the data more efficiently. And yet another thing that is uh, enabled uh, by the remote uh, GPU is uh, ARCUDA. ARCUDA is taking advantage of the RDMA technology and the high bandwidth interconnect to actually virtualize the service of a GPU. Similar to the way people are virtualizing storage services, having the storage behave as if it's locally, even though it's remote, you can do the same for GPU and you can do the same for more and other services using the RDMA technology. And why? Because it's very efficient to move the data and the overheads are low. And you can see here that the local GPU overhead, um, this is a base latency, and if you, you use remote GPU over InfiniBand, uh, it's going from 0.62 latency to 0.65 latency, so the delta in time is negligible. On the other hand, you can virtualize the service, you can deploy this way GPUs uh, in the cloud, you can mix and match the servers versus the GPUs, and this gives you a more clean and more efficient uh, design of the overall system. Let's talk about offload uh, versus uh, non-offload, which is actually called uh, onload. So there are two completely opposite architectures, um, and I want to cover a little bit about the, the main differences uh, because those, those questions come uh, quite often. So, so basically, if you look at the offload architecture, that's the, the architecture that uh, we as Mellanox are driving, is basically about moving more and more uh, of the uh, of the I.O. 
into the adapter, freeing a lot of CPU cycles to actually do the computation. The CPU is very expensive, so you, if you buy a CPU, you want to run your computation uh, on the CPU. So, first of all, the interconnect manages all the network operations, so all the transport is fully offloaded uh, into uh, the interconnect. And then the interconnect, because it already has offload capability and already has the right APIs, you can even further have uh, run more operation um, on the adapter, things like storage acceleration, collective operation, scatter gather, and, and many other things that you can actually go and push uh, into the adapter. And then you offload everything to the CPU and, um, and free CPU cycles for computation. Um, this adapter probably takes more to design, but you get better uh, ROI on, on the adapter. If you talk about onload architecture, the main, the, main, uh, the main thing behind onload architecture is that the NIC is very, very simple. All the work is being done in the CPU and the software, so CPU has to construct the packets, to push them into adapter, to pull them from the adapter. So it's a very uh, simplified architecture for the adapter. On the other end, everything has to be executed uh, on the CPU. And uh, the CPU takes care of all the network functions. Sometimes it has to be interrupted to service uh, incoming packets. RDMA, you can semantically mimic RDMA, but it's not true RDMA because placing data within the right place in memory needs an RDMA offload uh, adapter. Um, acceleration engine that also doesn't come uh, naturally into that, in, into that architecture. And uh, CPU cycles are obviously reduced because the I.O. is being uh, handled uh, by the adapter. And as, as I mentioned again, the, the R&D for developing such adapter is substantially lower. Therefore, a solution is, is on paper looks cheaper. On the other end, the ROI is substantially lower. And if you look at, um, at CPU, this is from the tip of the iceberg. But if you want to look at coprocessors and CPUs that are substantially uh, slower, things like GPU or Xeon Phi, then there is further uh, another difference in the performance um, of the overall system. So there is a paper um, um, that was evaluated the various technology of offload versus onload. Uh, long story short, you can see that the network performance really depends on the CPU frequency when you're doing, uh, when you're doing onload because the ability to push the network and to pull data from the network is really impacted by how much, how strong is the CPU. So if you're talking about Xeon frequency of 2.6 gigahertz, then that's something uh, quite fast and it can really uh, work uh, with those, uh, with, with, with the 100 gig uh, speed. On the other end, you still see some performance delta of maybe 20% uh, compared to an offload technology. But on the other end, if you start looking at accelerators that are very strong at doing certain operations, but the overall computation power is low there, taking a Xeon Phi or you might take other examples, then now you start seeing the delta uh, of, the, of, of the overall performance that you can actually achieve when you don't have the full offload capability. And here you can see some examples. On the top, on the top line, you can see uh, what happens when you have offload technology. So even if your device is slower, still the offload technology is responsible for moving the data. So moving the data is always efficient. Uh, you can see that. And here you can start seeing the deficiency of CPUs that are fast versus CPUs that are slow. And then uh, this is a major place uh, where we're seeing um, uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, communication uh, that is on load. So even though you have those devices, you don't manage to take advantage of the network. And a few other examples. So we managed uh, we, we, of, of the difference in technology. We, managed, we, we, we talked uh, today about the smart network for the smart systems, being able to push more and more operations into the network, especially with switch IB2, when you can do actually uh, collective operations uh, in the network and actually get anywhere from 10x to uh, 25x uh, more performance. Um, talking about 
things that are in production and resilient. Uh, and I think uh, for future and backward compatibility is yet another thing that is very important. So every time you have an old system and a new system, you want to be able to, to interconnect them. So there is a guarantee on InfiniBand uh, that you can actually uh, go ahead and do it. And every new generation is backward compatible with the previous generation. Um, going faster, so 100 gig is supported there from 2014. Uh, 200 gig is coming up. Melnox is extremely focused in, in making that happen. And this is like uh, for next generation design, so things are always on the radar. And we have managed in the past to execute and, and deliver those technologies. Power, power consumption is yet another part of your uh, operational expense of the data center, so 25% lower, substantially higher message rates than to, thanks to the offload technology. Switch latency is again lower, and scalability and CPU efficiency uh, much higher thanks to the offload. So thank you very much. I'll be happy, happy to take uh, questions. Any questions? All right, thank you very much.